say that I, I often use the analogy, should I be a good father or should I be a good husband? And the answer is obviously I should be both. I should be a good father and a good husband. Just like the gospel can transform nations, the gospel should be used for um, uh, in, in light of eternity. We need to be aware that often what we're going up against is the father of lies. There's lots of propaganda. And often I see people who do evangelism, they're reaching out, they're not aware of just how deceptive things are. So we talked about some ways that people are deceptive. As Christians, we can transform our communities, or we can allow negative, anti-biblical transformation into our churches. And we're going to look at that even more today. A biblical worldview is what the Bible teaches, not what we want it to teach. So we learn from the Bible, but we don't go and look in the Bible to support what we want. And that's really important. And then we touched on the very damaging teaching that is spread through the church and an idolatrous teaching that essentially God's goal is not to give God glory, but to give ourself glory, the Holy Spirit was given for conviction and righteousness, sin, and judgment. So as we look at this, we're going to open the Bible. We're going to look at a couple of different ways that people do evangelism. And I'm going to just lean in and really have you start to think, why is it that we do things certain ways? So the first thing I want to start with is maybe sin is more serious than we think. Maybe sin is more serious than we think. If we look at Matthew 5, 28, and it says, but I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has committed adultery with her in her heart. And then it goes on to say, no adulterer will be in the kingdom of heaven. This seems like a really hard saying. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Another very hard saying. Galatians says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, just simple covetousness, wanting what someone else has drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, I warned you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so we look around and we think we celebrate people who drive really fast cars, or maybe they have a jet. And we literally have pastors bragging about how many jets they have. We have People who take the mantle of Christianity as leaders and they promote things like envy. And it's put in that same list as orgies, sorcery, and idolatry. So maybe as a church, as a, as a worldwide church, we need to understand God's authority. And so as a quick review, we talked about the sin of a lie to a mom, because mom has limited authority, that sin only carries a small punishment. But as you go up in authority from a police officer, a judge, and a king, the same small sin carries a higher punishment because of higher authority. So how does God look in infinite authority at a lie? And this is how we come to a clear understanding when it talks about an eternal judgment, hell being a real place where people who go there experience misery. It's justice. And so we've lost kind of this, this gravity, this seriousness of sin. 
And so what happens is that we adjust our gospel presentation accordingly. Let's look and just kind of open up the Bible here. This is from Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So this is clearly written to people who believe deeply that they're going to heaven. But the one who does the will of my father who's in heaven, on that day, many, Jesus is not given to exaggeration. He does not exaggerate. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness or iniquity. Or another way to put it is you corrupt people. So Jesus himself, we're warned about this also in the epistles, in addition to the gospel, is saying there's going to be many people who claim the name of the Lord. They claim to be able to do prophecies and they do amazing casting out demons, but they are false prophets. So we're going to now go a little bit deeper. And I think it's important before we read this parable that we put a framework around when Jesus is explaining the parable. And so you'll want to maybe even write this down or remember this as we open up Matthew 18. So in general, they had a, an amount of money called a denarius. So that might be a, you know, a, a Swiss franc, a U.S. dollar, a peso. But a denarius then was the amount of money given for one day of labor. So if you went out and you worked in a vineyard, you worked in a field, maybe you were cleaning, doing something, the average payment for one day's work was one denarius. Now, the next amount of money we'll talk about is called a talent. So a talent, if you had 6,000 denarii, you would have one talent, or that's the amount that you would be paid for working 6,000 days. So back in this time in Israel, people on average worked six days a week. If they worked 50 weeks, because often they would take off two weeks a year for festivals, that gives us about 300 work days per year. So at this rate, a single talent was worth 20 years of labor. Okay. So a denarius is one day, a talent is worth 6,000 day, 6,000 talents or 6,000. I mean, a talent is worth 6,000 denarius. So every talent, this is important to remember, is worth 20 years of labor. This is a very, very high amount of money. So now let's look at this parable in Matthew 18. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, how much, again, if a single talent is 20 years of the, the amount of money you would make working in 20 years, then this servant owed this master 200,000 years of labor. I want that to really sink in. Often we read these things and we don't understand what Jesus was trying to get because we don't, we don't feel the full weight of what this audience would have heard when Jesus was describing this. The amount this servant owed, you know, he couldn't make up in thousands of lifetimes. This would be an insurmountable sum. So when he began to settle, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold 
with his wife, children, and all that he had in payment to be made. Now, what Jesus is saying is this servant owed so much money, there is no way ever he could pay it. And he's making an analogy to sin. Our debt of sin is totally unpayable. See, we all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Romans 6 says the wages of sin is death. Yeah. So what does the servant so do? The servant the falls on his knees, begs the master, says, have patience with me. I will pay you everything. Now, there is no way that this servant could pay that. And the master knows. So it says, and for pity, the master released his servant. It wasn't because the master believed the servant would ever pay. It was purely the, the pity, the love that the master had, that he offered him this free gift of salvation. Now, if I transfer that, imagine for, for a minute that it's 15, somebody makes 15 something. So if you're in Nigeria, it's whatever that, think about what that is. I did this for a, a laborer in the U.S., and this servant would be forgiven $7.2 billion. That's what this, if you put it in terms of U.S. US dollars. And so let's go on. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. Now, 100 denarii would be significant. That's going to be, you know, over three, four months worth of wage. If you think about even savings, it would have taken a couple of years for somebody to save up a hundred denarii. So this is not insignificant. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii and seizing him, he began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down, pleaded with him, have patience with me and I'll pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. And we know what happens from this parable. This person does not understand how much he was forgiven. And this he's called a wicked servant because he forgets the serious nature of his sin, his debt that he owed. And he is put himself into prison. There's a couple principles, though, that I think that's really important that Jesus is so clearly illustrating. He's illustrating that it is his love that forgives our eternal debt. When we present the gospel, we need to have a clear understanding that it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but it's by God's grace. If, for example, and we have to understand that the nature of sin, so people don't quickly forgive. If we had some small fine that someone paid for us, we wouldn't celebrate that really. It would just be, oh, somebody paid a fine for us. If, if we have an under true understanding of sin and we understand that we were pardoned from a death penalty, that is a much different way to understand the gospel. And we need to get back to a biblical understanding. So we talked about the difference between worldly grief. I rejoice not because you were grieved. We don't want people just to grieve, but we want it to grieve into repenting to where there's actually a transformation within the person. They were going one direction, and now they are not going that direction. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Worldly grief produces death. That's the person who's sad they got caught. They really don't want to change. It's They just get caught. So true believers are repentant. Feeling grief or guilt does not equal repentance. So feeling bad about your sin does not equal repentance. Another way I like to put this is I say conviction without action leads to guilt. And that leads to a hard heart. 
When the Holy Spirit comes in conviction, I can take a sin like a sin of pornography. And that person then feels guilt, but they continue in that sin. That leads to a hard heart. And over time, they get more and more comfortable in their sin. Repentance is conviction accompanied by an action. Hebrews 3.3 reads this, exhort or beg or implore one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And I see this from pulpits all over the world. Pastors will use illustrations from disgusting materials that their eyes should not have been looking at because they've been hardened. Their hearts have been hardened by the deceitfulness of lust, revenge, corruption. How many of our movies today that celebrate revenge do we love? Instead of what Jesus said, we're to love our enemies. We're to heap love on those who use us for wicked purposes. Yet we celebrate things that God does not celebrate. We need to draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. These are people who they, they want to follow the things of God, but they're longing for the things they do. It says, be wretched, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy turned to gloom. When we see the working of the Holy Spirit, does that look like people laying on the floor laughing? Or does conviction of the Holy Spirit look at a husband when he's on his phone and he's tempted to look at something he shouldn't and he sets that phone down and he goes to pray with his wife? Isn't that what a Holy Spirit filled life looks like that comes under that conviction? When we read things like 1 Peter chapter 2, it says he bore, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. We can look to Calvary's cross to the see the seriousness of sin. Spurgeon said something beautiful. He said, remember that the Lord Jesus came to take away sin in three ways. He came to remove the penalty of sin. We would call that salvation. The power of sin, meaning that we don't have to be under the power of temptation. And at last, the presence of sin. Let me be very clear on something. Most People only want to be saved from the punishment of sin. Most people only want to be saved from the punishment of sin, but very few want to be saved from the personal presence of their sin. That is the definition of a lukewarm person. I don't want to be punished, but I want to be able to continue in my sin and have forgiveness. That is not repentance. So we're going to look at a couple of analogies. This quote is by a man named um, Ray Comfort. He says, we need to adjust our presentation of the gospel. We cannot dismiss the fact that God hates sin and punishes sinners with eternal torment. How can we begin a gospel pre presentation 
by telling people on their way to hell that God has a wonderful plan for their lives. Think about that. How can we tell people on their way to, to hell that God has a plan for their life? It's true that God does have a plan for their lives, but it's that they would repent and trust the Savior, Jesus Christ, and receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So he has a classic analogy, and you'll have to forgive. This is a very old video clip where he goes through it, but I think he does a nice job. And he uses what's called an, uh, an, a parachute illustration. And so what he's going to do is he's going to say, essentially, give two people go onto an airplane. The first person is given a parachute and says, this parachute is going to give you a better flight. Well, what happens when that flight doesn't go well? Maybe, and I think he's going to say that coffee is spilled on them. Well, the person is going to take off the parachute, believing they were told a lie because they thought the parachute was going to give them a better flight. And he uses that to say, this is like Christianity. If we say, put on Christianity, it's going to give you a better flight. Well, what happens when bad things happen? Those, pers those people then will be like seed sown in bad soil, and they're not going to be real Christians. Now imagine you get on an airplane, and you're given a, a parachute, and that parachute, you're told, is necessary because the mechanic said, this plane will not hold up. It's not taken care of. Imminent destruction is coming. You will need this parachute to survive. And so he will go over this analogy again. And I'm going to jump to, so just for time's sake, into it, it just a little bit. When you look at law as a schoolmaster that brings us to Christ, by the law is the knowledge of sin, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, it's important for people to know that. Not try can you hear that? Okay, thumbs up if you can hear it. Choose. So on and so forth. Okay. Great filler. So on and just, so forth. Whatever you want, to just do it. Yeah, make it there. on forth and so on. All right, we're gonna go now to a video clip. <laughs> I think I might have heard this before. <laughs> it's you. Yeah. Let's roll it. Modern evangelism therefore had to find another reason for sinners to respond to the gospel, and the issue that modern evangelism chose was the issue of life enhancement. The gospel degenerated into Jesus Christ will give you peace, joy, love, fulfillment, and lasting happiness. Now, to illustrate the unscriptural nature of this very popular teaching, we would like you to listen very carefully to this following anecdote, because the essence of what we're saying pivots on this particular point. Two men are seated on a plane. The first is given a parachute and told to put it on because it would improve his flight. Now, the guy's a little skeptical at first because he can't see how putting a parachute on in a plane could possibly improve his flight. But after a while, he decides to experiment and see if the claim is true. And as he puts it on, he notices the weight of it on his shoulders and the fact that he can't sit straight up. But he comforts himself with the fact that he was told the parachute would improve his flight. And so he decides to give the thing a little time. And as he waits, he notices that some of the other passengers are laughing at him. And as they continue to point and laugh, he finally can't stand it any longer. He slinks in his seat, unstraps the parachute, and throws it on the floor. Bitterness and disillusionment fill his heart because as far as he's concerned, he was told an outright lie. The second man is given a parachute, but listen to what he's told. He's told to put it on because at any moment he'd be jumping 25,000 feet out of the plane. He gratefully puts the parachute on. He doesn't notice the weight of it upon his shoulders, nor that he can't sit upright. His mind is consumed with the thought of what would happen to him if he jumped without that parachute. Now let's analyze the motive and the result of both passengers' experience. The first man put on the parachute solely to improve his flight. And the result of his experience was that he was humiliated by the other passengers. He was disillusioned and bitter toward those who gave him the parachute. As far as he's concerned, it'll be a long time before someone gets one of those things on his back again. Now, the second man put on a parachute solely to escape the jump to come. And because of his knowledge of what would happen to him without the parachute, he has a deep-rooted joy and peace in his heart 
knowing that he's going to be saved from sure death. This knowledge gives him the ability to withstand the mockery from the other passengers, and his attitude toward those who gave him the parachute is one of heartfelt gratitude. Now listen to what the modern gospel says. It says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll give you love, joy, peace, fulfillment, and lasting happiness. In other words, Jesus will improve your flight. So the sinner responds, and in an experimental fashion, puts on the Savior to see if the claims are true. And what does he get? The promise, temptation, tribulation, and persecution. The other passengers mock him. So what does he do? He takes off the Lord Jesus Christ. He's offended for the word's sake. He's disillusioned and somewhat embittered, and quite rightly so. He was promised peace, joy, love, fulfillment, and lasting happiness, and all he got were trials and humiliation. His bitterness is directed at those that gave him the so-called good news. His latter end becomes worse than the first, another inoculated and bitter backslider. So hopefully that makes a little sense. So what I want to do in this next section is I'm going to show two different presentations of the gospel. One presentation is going to be done with what's called a word of knowledge. He's going to say, oh, I see you doing something. And I want you to, again, this message isn't to tell you what to believe, but to put yourself in this boy's shoes and ask yourself, was he given a biblical gospel? This is very important. And so let's digest on it. It will at first, I think, seem quite lovely, a, quite a lovely way to do it. But then I really want you to step back and go, were they given a biblical gospel? When you look at it's one of those places that Hitler actually wanted to establish a spiritual gathering place. It happens to be one of those places that is like one of the top. What a great place for light to shine. This entire region is a spiritual hotspot. It is. It has always been. Nowadays, it's no. a gathering place of um, yeah. Satanists. No. Which persons? Which oh, really? Yes. We we'll walked outside, and there was some construction guy there with a with his helper. We walked up and said, "Hey, how you doing? Yeah, can I pray for you? Can you? Yeah. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. God, I ask you to bless him. Bless him, God. Increase grace and awareness of you. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. So I started praying for him. I got this picture of him being an architect, being one that designs different buildings. And so uh, as I was praying for you, I saw you uh, drawing buildings and sketching different, different buildings for building. And I, and I believe that, that God's going God's gonna to give you that dream in your heart. Ich glaube, dass Gott dir den Traum in deinem Herzen geben wird. Have you ever thought of building before? Habt ihr schon mal daran gedacht, Gebäude zu zeichnen? Sie sagt, sie kommt als Architektur. She's been an intern at an uh, for an uh, architect. An intern for an architect. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty awesome, man. And here the kid is training to be an architect. That's what he wants to do. So it's like, yeah, I'm really excited. I started to share the gospel with him and just asked him if he would like to have this Jesus, the one that spoke to me. This kid gets born again. I believe that Jesus, that Jesus died, died for my sin. For my sin. I'm asking you, I'm asking you to, forgive me to forgive me of all of my sin. Of all of my sin. We want to send them some information and we want to get them plugged into a church that's in the area because it's not okay for people um, to give their life to God and then not have them be a part of some family somewhere because the local church is really important. For that kid to know that you can hear God, it's a big deal to be able to, to know where he's headed in life and to talk to him and then to see him as an architect and say, I'm an intern for an architect, to know that the kid's dream is this. And to pull on that dream and then have God 
share his dream. It'll change his life, man. It gives kids a hope and a future. And so we come to a castle, man, just for one kid. It's worth it. Okay, so we see here the child in this experience came to Christ because the gentleman was able to associate his work with that. Now let's look at another approach to the gospel through two different people. How do you know there's an afterlife? How do you know the Bible's the word of God? Is there any way to know for sure? I believe faith is um, the number one thing that's, uh, that's important about it. Let me play skeptic. If I said to you, I don't want to have blind faith. I, want, I don't want to have faith. I want something concrete. Is there anything concrete we can give somebody who wants to hang the intellectual hat on? Let me give you an example. You ever study Bible prophecy? Uh, not really. Do you know the book of Ezekiel? speaks of the nations that will come down and attack Israel in the last days. And the prophet actually named the nations, and we can see that happening on the news. The fact that God knows the future and he's put his future in his word is evidence that the Bible is the word of God and you can trust his promises. And his promises for everlasting life. Your name is Sincere, is that right? Yes. Do you believe there's an afterlife? I think so, yeah. I like. I believe in like reincarnation and stuff. You believe in God? Yes. Do you think hell exists? Uh, yes. Where are you going when you die? I don't really know. It's up to God, really. Shouldn't you find out? Yeah. Could you be going to hell? No, I don't believe so. You sure about that? I hope so. Are you a good person? Yes, I am a good person. You know, the Bible says, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Speaking the presence of God, it says, he that has clean hands and a pure heart. Is your heart pure? I, I think it's pure. Do you think you're a good person? I like to say I am. Okay, let me see if I can change your mind. Jesus said, there's none good but God. Who's lying, you or Jesus? <laughs> it's the story of the rich young ruler. There's none good. And let me show you God's standard of goodness. It means moral perfection and thought, word, and deed. So let's see if you're a good person. How many lies have you told in your life? Definitely a few. Stolen anything? I have. So you're a lying thief? Uh, I guess so. You still think you're a good person? Probably not. You know, the purpose of the Ten Commandments is to bring the knowledge of sin. Most people think, oh, God gave us Ten Commandments as a standard to live by. No, it's a standard we don't live by. When Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, he showed us God's standard. The Bible says of the Messiah, he would magnify the law, that's the moral law, the Ten Commandments, and make it honorable. Let me show you what he did. He said, you've heard it said by them of old, you shall not commit adultery. That's the Seventh Commandment. And then he said, but I say to you, whoever looks upon a woman to lust for her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. Did you know that? Uh, I do. Have you looked with lust? Uh, I say I have. Many times. Many times. Have you ever used God's name in vain? I believe so. Do you love your mum? 100%. Would you ever use her name as a cuss word? Never. Never, because you respect her. 100%. You don't respect the God that gave you a mother. You took his holy name and used her in a place of a filth word to express disgust. Godly Jews won't write God's name down because it's so holy, and you have used it in blasphemy. Very serious. So here's the summation, Sincere. This is for you to judge yourself for Judgment Day. You've told me you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, fornicating, adulterer at heart, and you're self-righteous, which is a sin in God's eyes, and saying you're a good person, and it's obvious you're not. You're like the rest of us. So if God judges you by the Ten Commandments, we've looked at four on Judgment Day, will you be innocent or guilty? I'll be guilty. Heaven or hell? Hell. Yeah. What do you think you have to do to avoid the damnation of hell? Uh, devote my heart to God and not really do all that stuff I did from the past. Kind of. Have you ever heard the gospel? I don't, I don't really know. So the law is bringing to you a knowledge of sin, so you can see how serious sin is in God's eyes. You ever heard the Bible verse, the wages of sin is death? I think I have, but I think I need to be reminded about that. It's a very famous verse, Romans 6.23, and it's saying God is paying you in death for your sins. Like a judge who looks at a criminal who's committed murder, but he keeps saying, I'm a good person, judge. The judge says, I'm going to show you how serious your crime is. I'm giving you the death sentence. This is your wages. This is what you've earned. And Jonathan's sin is so serious to our holy God, he's given you the death sentence. Your death will be evidence to you that God is deadly serious about sin, and you've earned your wages. 
So on judgment day, if God judges you by those 10 commandments, will you be innocent or guilty? Most likely guilty. Absolutely guilty. Heaven or hell? Since I'm guilty, most likely hell. You know, the Bible says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire, no thief, no blasphemer, no adulterer, or the one inherit God's kingdom. So can you see that you're in big trouble? Yes, sir. So what can you do to get right with God? Uh, confess that Jesus is Lord. He died on the cross for our sins and uh, it resurrected three days later. At the moment, you're under God's wrath, heading for hell. How can the death of Jesus on the cross help you 2,000 years later? He died for our sins. And what does that mean? For us to have eternal life with him or a chance at eternal life with him. A chance? Let me share the gospel with you, and it'll be a relief to you. Jonathan, if you can get a grip of this, it's going to change everything for you. The Ten Commandments are called the moral law. You and I broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on that cross. That's why he said it is finished just before he died. He was saying paid in full. If you're in court and you've got speeding fines, the judge will let you go if someone pays those fines. Even though you're guilty, you say, a lot of fines here, but you can leave because someone's paid them. And it's legal. Well, God can take the death sentence off you. He can legally let you live forever, all because of what Jesus did on the cross for his death and resurrection. And all you have to do, according to the Bible, to find everlasting life, is repent of your sins and trust in Jesus. Do you know what repentance is? Gives your sins away, right? Yeah, you turn from sin. You can't say I'm a Christian, but you lie and fornicate and blaspheme and look at porn. That's just deceiving yourself, playing the hypocrite. So you've got to be genuine. You've got to be sincere. And then you trust in Jesus like you trust a parachute. You don't just believe in a parachute. You put your faith into it. The second you repent and trust in Jesus, God will wash you clean of your sins, grant you everlasting life as a free gift, and he'll give you your own personal miracle. You'll suddenly want to please the God that gave you life more than anything. The Bible puts it this way. God says, I'll write my law upon your heart and cause you to walk in my statutes. In other words, he'll make you want to do the things that please him, and that's your own personal miracle. Is this making sense? Yes. You're going to think about what we talked about today? Yeah, a lot. If you're going to jump out of a plane 10,000 feet, why would you put on a parachute? It's a way of safety. Yeah, you don't want to die. And your motivation is fear. And that fear is your friend, not your enemy, because it's making you put on a parachute. And Jonathan, because I love you, I've tried to put the fear of God in you today. I've tried to make you scared, hoping you'll see that fear as your friend, not your enemy, because it'll make you serious with God and drive you to the foot of the cross where you'll find everlasting life. Is this making sense? Yes, yeah, sir. You're going to think about what we talked about? 100%. Have you ever truly repented with a knowledge of how serious sin is? Because today that law has brought the knowledge of sin. It stirred your conscience. My suspicion is that in the past you've been a little flippant about sin and haven't found a place of genuine sorrow and true repentance, and that's been your problem. Would that be right? I'll say so. Are you sorry for your sins now? 100%. You're ready to repent and trust in Jesus with all your heart and not your goodness? Yes, sir. Can I pray with you? Yes. Father, I pray for Jonathan. Thank you for his open heart today and the fact that he's listened and that his conscience was tender. I pray this day you'll find a place of true contrition, sorrow for sin, and genuine repentance. Be born again and pass from death to life all because of your wonderful mercy and your amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're tearing up? Yeah, a little bit. You know what that is? It's contrition. Do you know what contrition is? Yeah, contrition is a genuine sorrow for your sins. And the Bible says a contrite heart God will not despise. So every tear is precious in God's eyes because it shows the genuineness of your faith in Him and your desire to get right with Him. Do you have a Bible at home? Uh, physical Bible, no. I'm going to give you a Gospel of John, which is the fourth book in the New Testament. A book I've written called Volatile, which names the nations that God said would attack Israel and will boost your faith in the Word of God. And I'm going to give you a little book called Save Yourself Some Pain, Principles of Christian Growth. That's the Gospel of John. It's like a bundle of money, but it's more precious than all the money in the world. Volatile, the nations that the Bible says would attack Israel in the latter days. So when are you going to repent and put your faith in Jesus? Starting today. You serious? Yes. So you're giving up the battle. You're saying, God, I need your mercy. Are you sorry for your sins? Yeah, I'm very sorry for my sins. Can I pray with you? Yes. 
Father, I pray for Sincere that this day he'll find a place of true sorrow for sin and genuine repentance, and he'll catch a glimpse of your holiness and what you did on the cross, that he might be saved from wrath. And this day, as he repents and trusts in you, may he be born again with a new heart, new desires, and find peace with you and the gift of everlasting life, all because of your kindness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Dear God, uh, I'm sorry for all the sins I did, and I want to repent all my sins and give my heart to you because I, I love you. I know you're going to watch over me because you keep giving me all these chances and I, I, I've been taking it for granted. So I want to start today of uh, giving my heart to you and repent because uh, I want to go to heaven. And also I want you to um, watch over me and keep on watching over me. Can I give you a book that I've written called Scientific Facts in the Bible? Yes. Thank you. You made my day. You made me really think about life. Thank God. Real quick, here are three things to help. So hopefully in those two videos, you can see a dramatic difference in the presentation of the gospel. One is based on the biblical understanding of why Jesus went to the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. And the other one brings glory to man. One being brings glory to Jesus Christ. One brings glory to the person who is able to guess an internship. One, the young man has no idea of the seriousness of his sin. And the, the scary part of it is me, May, he put on a parachute because God would give him his dream, a better flight. The others are leaning into Christianity because they're sinners and need a savior. One way is true love. One way is not. Titus 3.5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Why would we need mercy? We need mercy because of the wrath to come somebody who's living life perfectly doesn't cry out oh god give me mercy somebody who's not in trouble in front of a judge won't go to the judge and cry out judge please be merciful to me no they see no need for mercy Ephesians, all over scripture, we see these principles. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, makes us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved. So before the break, I have a simple question. And really, it's a statement actually, what we win the next generation with is what we win the next generation to. So if we win the next generation with emotion to Christ, guess what? Then we win them to emotion. That's why they will be there. If we win them with pizza, games, lively music, we win the next generation to pizza, games, and lively music, or for whatever reason, if we want to win the next generation with a promise of prosperity, a promise of health, a promise of a better life, that's what we win them to. But if we win them with truth, we win them to truth. See, truth is necessary. Emotions change, but truth will remain. So, at this point, I like to open if there's any questions. If not, we can uh, go tell, you know, 25 minutes after or something like that. But I do want to turn it over to Wheeler. And if there's any questions in the next few minutes, that would be just fine. And if not, then we will take our break. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Any questions from uh, Abuja Ibadan? <laughs> How are you, Do you hear me? Just say yes. Yes, hello, David. Hello, Marcus. You can hear me? Yes, I hear you. Uh, um, just to say what David said, it's really also, always amazing for me to hear him, to, to really think about our evangelist, of evangelism, what we are doing, what is really the point, how we can help people to understand, because to finding, finding change of Christ, we have to change in our thinking and not just find our pleasure in life. So when we not bring people to the point that a change is necessary, that something can change, then actually we, we not really can give them Jesus Christ. And, and he put, I mean, it's really hard to hear that, and especially when we, you would probably do the same on the street like the others wanted, but we really have to reflect on that. I, I think it's really, really a good point that it brought David. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus, for sharing. Um, yeah, I think so. We'll go for break now. And um, yeah, if any questions, then you can also put on the chat. And we will be back um, at uh, 4.25. Thank you. When we read something like Titus 1 6, it says they profess to know God. We have to understand who is this too. These are people who say they know God, but they deny them by what they do. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. So the lukewarm church is this what we are dealing with? And then how do we? work within the framework how do we become overcomers within this body so one of the things i often look at is and this is very simplistic or very simple is i see the convergence of basically lukewarm living and boasting that's permeated the church and so some things on social media, if we have somebody who is glorying in their sensuality, but puts a Bible verse on it, or they're glo glorying in their strength, this is just two kind of funny ways, but they're actually point to how people actually live their life. We can't just add a Bible verse to non-virtue, and suddenly it becomes God-honoring. So self-glorification is a big problem. James in chapter 4 and 5 says this, And it is you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming on to you. Your riches have rotted your garments and are moth-eaten. The idea that we can live how we want to live our life as part of the gospel, we can have churches that incorporate iniquity, all of these things into them, we, we get people to come to these churches, and then we tell them that God will listen to them. And so a lot of times I like to ask in an interactive group, will God always listen? It's kind of an interesting thing. So let's read here from Amos chapter 5. Hear this word that I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? 
It is darkness, not light, as a man fled from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Why is the Lord comparing it? Somebody who wants to see him as a bear, a lion, and a serpent. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? So why is this recorded in Amos? He says it. This is the word of the Lord coming through Amos. I hate, I despise your feast, your celebrations. I would even say, if we put it in today's comments, your worship service. I hate and despise your worship. I take no delight in your solemn meetings. Even though you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings or prayer, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fatted animal, I will not look to them. Listen to this. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen. Let justice roll down the waters and righteousness. What is righteousness? It's living in accordance to God's design in all things. I want to reintroduce, I'm sure somebody has introduced the word to you before. It's the word we translate as sin or iniquity. It's amartia in Greek. And it literally means to miss the mark. So if you can imagine you have a, a target. So let's say you have a target, something that looks kind of like this, and you have an arrow to hit the mark, it says is righteousness. Amartia or sin is to not hit the market, the target. So it means to do things that you shouldn't when you know what to do and you choose not to do it that is sin hebrews talks about amartia the sin and weights that drag us down so there are things in our life that are truly sinful that we miss the mark and then there's weights these are things that aren't necessarily immoral a weight is something that we do that doesn't help us. There's an interesting study that was done in Europe, Asia, and in the United States looking at video game use. And it was primarily phone video game use. And what they found is over time with age, on average, the average person is playing video games on their phone between six and eight hours a day and that was independent of any age group. The older you were, you tended to play certain types of, of games. And so when we look at that, what does it mean to waste eight, uh, excuse me, eight hours a week? That would be a weight, not something that is particularly, I would say maybe quote unquote evil. Obviously there's many of video games and things like that. But when they looked at social media use, from 2013 to 2023, in 2013, on average was two hours and one minute global use of social media per day. That increased over an hour in less than a decade to almost three hours a day is the average social media use. What would happen if we took all of that time that is wasted in learning what it means to have a biblical worldview, to really dig in. Instead of missing the mark, we would hit the mark. And in addition to that, we would give up these weights. That's just an aside. So I wanted to just spend a minute to allow the Holy Spirit to work. But let's get back to this injustice and non-righteousness. I was giving a, a series of lectures in Nigeria to a pastor's conference. And I asked the pastors a very simple question. 
Now, those of you probably in Switzerland and areas like that who cover the Reformation will know the answer to this question quite simply. And I said, what was the name of the theses that Martin Luther put at the door of Wittenberg Castle? What were they about? And to, not to my surprise, there was a few people who knew roughly what it was about, but nobody could name them. And here is the door of Wittenberg Castle to where those 95 theses were put. The official name in English, obviously it wasn't in English, it was would have been in German, the disputation on the power and efficacy of indulgences. So what Martin Luther, one of many things he was frustrated with was this use of an indulgence. So an indulgence is the grant of remission. So it is a payment for the punishment in what the Catholic Church had for purgatory. So basically, it was giving money to a religious leader so that the person or the person they were doing it on behalf would get extra grace or extra mercy from God. And so often how this would work was you maybe had a relative that died and they would give money to the church in order for that relative to get out of purgatory, a non-scriptural um, place. And what it did is it made the Catholic church very wealthy. But the principle remained the same. They give a quote unquote, not a true man of God. They give someone money. And then that person acts as almost like the Old Testament priest, but as a priest to get them favor from God. So let's go to Matthew 6. This is Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount. For where your treasure is, there your heart will, also, will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is a very clear scripture. And what's unique about this is it says that money is a unique sin in that it blinds you to that sin. And what do I mean by that? If uh, I've been using pornography a fair amount, so I'll just use it. I have yet to meet somebody who partakes of pornography who goes, actually, that's not a problem. They know what they're doing is wrong. Now, they may fall into temptation. They may sin, but they're not blinded to the fact that it's wrong. What it says about the sin of, of the love of money is that it blinds you so you actually don't know you have it. There's a, uh, a, a pastor who went home to be with the Lord, I think about 24 months ago. His name was Tim Keller. And Tim Keller did a lot of counseling over his 40 years as being a pastor. And what's interesting is he said in 40 years of being a pastor, actually, he didn't say, he said, in my entire time as being a pastor, not once has someone come to me for counsel on the love of money. He had had people come for all sorts of reasons on other sins. They had come for counseling on immorality they had come for marriage advice, all sorts of things. But the love of money literally blinds us so we do not see often how blinded we are. And what it says is when that comes into your whole body, it actually blinds you to other sins as well. So when we think about the Reformation to take hold, 
if you study the Reformation, you will see Luther really, what I would say, tilled the ground, broke up the rough ground for the Reformation to even be possible. And it started, the Reformation started, corruption from the church had to be removed. If we go back a little bit further, though, and we look at what, when the church was first birthed, what was the last major public thing that Jesus did before going to the cross? Very similar to what Martin Luther saw that had to happen. In Matthew 20, 21, it says, then Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of money and changers with the seats of those selling doves. And he declared, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. We would have not had a spirit-filled church in Acts chapter 2 without Jesus making such a public proclamation to his church. We see the death in the Holy Spirit to Ananias and Sapphira for lying about money. We should sit with that and go, if we want a church that transforms culture, a church that makes disciple, what is our view of money? Now, I'm not saying that money isn't useful. I'm saying if we truly follow biblical principles of loving our neighbor, living without corruption, we actually create societies that flourish beautifully. And what ends up happening is when this happens, we get amazing cultures where we don't have to pay for security. We don't have to do all of these things. This isn't an anti-money thing. It's an anti-love of money, above loving God, and above loving others. We need to root out corruption in the church. This is what Martin Luther said. He said, why does not the Pope, whose wealth today is greater than the wealth of the richest, who built the Basilica of St. Peter with his own money, rather than money of poor believers. See, he was saying that we're building churches on the backs of poor people. Why is this happening? And I'll tell you how it was happening. Poor people were told, come to me by the church. Give the church all your money, and we will give you blessing. Give the church money, and, the, and God will give you more money. And the poor remained poor because it wasn't based on societal transformation. It wasn't based on a biblical worldview. And I would say almost out of anything in this lecture other than sin. Remember this. Society will never be more virtuous than the church. Society will never be more virtuous than the church. If we don't want a corrupt government, then let us cleanse the church of corruption. Society will never be more virtuous than the church. If we don't want a corrupt government, then let us cleanse the church of corruption. Cambridge University did an interesting study. These were atheists and they were looking at large successful countries. And they're, they're saying, what countries have a tremendous amount of natural resources, yet their people are, have a really high form of corruption. And so what they did is they did one of the largest studies and it was based out of Nigeria because Nigeria has so much natural resources. They have some of the best growing seasons, some of the best soil, some of the most industrious people on the planet. So they have natural resources and all sorts of things. And what they did is they found this paradox and they were so confused at the anger that the Nigerian people had toward the government, but not in anger, 
toward the church. So this is what this huge research study was so confused about. They said, this paper attempts to understand why Nigerians who are so aggrieved about corruption and inequality at the same time are drawn to churches that reproduce many of the same dynamics. What they're saying is, why are we going to churches that have pastors who fly around in private jets no different than the corrupt leaders of the government, drive around in fancy Mercedes-Benz, G-Wagons, all of these things, taken from the money of the poorest. It's no different than what Martin Luther was against. These are unbelievers trying to figure out, and this is what is kind of the point. When you look at the early church and you look at, this is what an atheist says about the church today. This is no different than what we're experiencing in the West. It's no different. We see this all over the world. I'm not picking on Nigeria. It's just this happened, this study happened to be in Nigeria. So here you have unbelievers looking at this and going, well, this is no surprise. This is what's happening in the church. This is what's happening in the government. But look at what an unbeliever said about the early church. This is Mathedes writing to Diognetius. This is about 130 AD in a letter. Listen how they described the church at this time. They marry like everyone else. And they have children, but they do not destroy their offspring. It means they love their kids. They share in a common table, meaning they were helpful to one another, but not in a common bed. They exist in the flesh, they're people, but they don't live by the flesh. They pass their days on earth, they're trying to make things better, but they're citizens of heaven. They are poor, yet make many rich. They lack everything, yet they overflow in everything. That's a picture of the early church. Me rewriting it another way is, is pagans are promiscuous with their body, and they're stingy with their money. Christians are stingy with their body, but promiscuous with their money. Martin Luther said, in short, I will preach it, teach it, write it, but I will constrain no one by force, for faith comes freely without compulsion. That is definitely in a different way than Islam. Take myself as an example. I oppose the indulgence with all the papists, but never with force. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept or I drank, the word or the Bible did everything. We need to lead biblically forward. Not preacher forward, but biblically forward. It's the Bible that transforms lives. When we see early transformation, we see that the Bible was to be the center around which the family was established. And when you teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, tie them as reminders about your hands. It means literally have the Bible with everything you do. Bind them on your forehead. Now, they literally would tie little scriptures on there, but what it means is your thinking process needs to run through a biblical worldview. That's what will transform it. Because when problems happen, if we bring people into fellowship with a false God, this God that just everything is going to turn out perfectly for you, what happens when that doesn't happen. So I wanna use an example. This man has been a mentor to my children when he was alive. My kids took classes from him. His name is Nabil Qureshi. He's a former 
Muslim. He wrote a very popular book called Seeking Allah because he was looking for God and he found Jesus. And so he went from being an Islamic missionary to being a Christian missionary. I highly, highly recommend this book. He died September 16th, several years ago, due to stomach cancer. Now, what was so unique about Nabil is Nabil was a medical doctor. So he trained in the U.S., went to medical school. He was actually working on his Ph.D. at Oxford when he was diagnosed. He never did finish his Ph.D., but he did get another master's in theology. Now, as a medical doctor, Nabil was given a diagnosis when he was very young of stomach cancer. Now, stomach cancer is one of the most deadly cancers you can get. And so what you're going to see in this video clip of him speaking, I want you to listen to what he says. What he's going to do is he's not going to go, well, I better give, I better sow a seed of health. I better go to my church or go to my famous pastor and give them a thousand dollars. So God will reward me with better health or with $10,000. No, what does he do? This is what he's going to say in the video. This is a man who knows that he only has a 4% chance of living. Basically, he 100% knows he's going to die. This is what he says. He's going to, he says, I will tell you what I did after receiving this diagnosis. He sits down to know the truth. He wants to know what's true. So he sits down and says, I want to make sure I'm on the right track. Every few months I do this anyways. How many of us evaluate is what we believe true? So this is what he does. He says this isn't a new exercise. He's used to doing it all over, over and over again. But every few months I go back and I make sure my theology is right from the beginning. So I ask the question of theism, does God exist? How many of us that are in this lecture could give five reasons why God exists outside the Bible? All of us should be able to do this. This is the foundation of a biblical worldview. Argument from morality cosmological argument, the ontological argument. There's argument from design. There's so many good reasons why God exists. Are we going to take the time in order to go, I know God exists. That measure of truth, when we know God exists, gives us confidence, courage, and boldness then to share the gospel. But if we came to the gospel because we were told God is going to give us a better career, well, what happens when we don't? Well, maybe it wasn't true. Maybe it was. We're not basing it on truth. So he starts with the answer, does God exist? And then after I answer this question with the resounding yes, not, he does it, why? Because of the evidence. Do you know we have positive evidence that God exists? I teach a 14-week series on how you can know God exists. I then ask the question, is this a God of chaos or a God of order and love? See, those things go hand in hand, and I end up with a resounding yes. I conclude God is a God of love. Then I ask of all the God theories, this is now he's getting into the God theories, religions, of all the God theories in the world, which one has the most evidence behind it? And does it cohere with being a God of love? And this is where I return to the Christian faith. Is he returning to the Christian faith based on some feeling he has? some quote-unquote closeness to God. Absolutely, he's not. He's returning to what is true. 
there's excellent evidence that Jesus claimed to be God and proved it by dying on the cross and rising from the dead. We have good reason to believe the scripture. Do you see the difference? This is a man who knows he's going to die, who can stare death in the face and go, I know because I follow the truth. It's not a man looking for a spiritual high who knows he's close to God because of some experience. In fact, when he doesn't feel close to God, he can still be following God. And how do I know this? Does feeling close to God equate to godliness? Absolutely not. It's recorded in Jeremiah. It says, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Do you believe that Jesus in his humanity, not his divinity, in his humanity, felt close to God the Father in the garden? No. The garden of Gethsemane. He said, let this cup pass from me. It says he sweat as if it were great drops of blood. He was in agony. But was he in God's will? Absolutely. Obedience to God does not mean wonderful things will happen to you. Often it means the opposite. But when you build your foundation on a faith that you have been forgiven 200,000 years worth of iniquity, you will gladly stand in that camp with Jesus Christ and go, I am nothing. He is everything. Like John the Baptist said, he must increase. I must decrease. Let's listen to a man who went home to be with the Lord who knew he was going to die, whose biblical worldview was so grounded, he could give this little sermonette. Uh, this is Nabil. Um, thank you so much for uh, your love and your support. Over the past week, I announced eight days ago that um, I have received this diagnosis. Let me give you a little bit of background. Um, this is kind of a scary disease insofar as uh, nobody saw it coming, not even my doctors. Um, so back in December, I started getting a little bit of indigestion. No big deal at all. I've had indigestion before. Take some Tums, you'll be fine. Uh, a few months later, the pain started getting a bit worse. Um, and so I decided to go in to see a doctor. And the doctor gave me Prilosec and said, hey, come back uh, if this doesn't work. Come back in about a month's time, after a month's time, if this doesn't work. When they scoped me, um, was two weeks ago. And that's when they saw something very concerning, uh, cut to four days later. Um, and, uh, the diagnosis was, uh, stage four stomach cancer, uh, specifically in poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma arising probably from the gastric cardia. And so, uh, the prognosis of survival uh, to five years is 4% chance. Um, and the days since then, and for those of you who are doing the math, that was exactly on the 11th anniversary of my accepting Christ. So I'll tell you what I did. Um, immediately after receiving this diagnosis, uh, I sat down and I said, let's make sure that I'm on the right track here. And every few months I do this anyway. So this wasn't like a, a new exercise, but every few months I go back and I make sure that my theology is straight from the very beginning. So I start with the question of theism, does God exist? And then after I answer that question with a resounding yes, because of the evidence, I then ask the question, this, is this a God of chaos or a God of order and love? Uh, which I think do go hand in hand. And I end up with, again, a resounding yes, this world can only be the way it is if it is a God of love. Now, of course, people will say, look at all the suffering in the world. How can you say God is a God of love? And I say, that's because you're micro focusing on some things. The fact that we can speak, the fact that we can think, the fact that there's any order and that we're not just a big amorphous blob of heat uh, means that God is a God of order. And to cultivate order, I think requires love. Um, but that's a whole other conversation. Anyway, so I conclude that God is a God of love. 
And then I ask of all the God uh, theories in the world, which one has the most evidence behind it? And does it cohere with God being a God of love? And this is where I return to the Christian faith, that there's excellent evidence that Jesus claimed to be God and proved it by dying on the cross and rising from the dead. We have good reason to believe the scripture. Uh, and when we turn to the scripture, we find that Christ has died on the cross for our sins, that we don't have to try to merit our own salvation. And how huge a relief that is when you're staring death in the face. How huge a relief it is when you're staring death in the face. This is what it means. This is what it looks like to be a true disciple and to have a biblical worldview. This is not what is being taught in many churches today. We need to get back to a biblical understanding of what it means to be a disciple. If anyone comes to me who's speaking here, this is Jesus and does not hate his life. Yes. Even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. What does that mean? Does that mean that you hate being married? Does that mean? No. What it means is this is a person who comes to Jesus with the full understanding or the fullest human understanding we can have of sin. Who hates the fact they're the sinner. They're like this young man who just, he knows it's true. The Holy Spirit has convicted him of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And he's like, I know this is true. I have godly sorrow. I hate my sin. I hate what it did to Jesus Christ. He cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. But the odd thing about this is when you feel the weight and you understand in some measure the amount of sin to actually follow Jesus becomes a delight. The one who can give you your eternal pardon, the one can, can take you from a eternal death sentence and can call you child. You can then call him father. Any of you does not give up everything he has. Now, what is it really saying? He's saying that you don't have anything anyways. You have nothing to offer God for your salvation. Cannot be my disciple. He who has ears, it's a spiritual hear, spiritual understanding, let him hear. I'm a director for Health Teams International. I lead te medical teams all over the world. Um, and one of my aspects, one of the hats that I wear, one of the parts of my career and there is a great organization um, that we work with occasionally. It's called Samaritan's Purse, and they respond to difficult areas. There's a, a physician who is a true disciple of Jesus Christ. His name is Kent Brantley. And uh, in Morovia, there was an Ebola outbreak. Um, many of you are familiar with the seriousness of Ebola. It's a hemorrhagic fever. Um, very, very serious. It has about a 50% kill rate, meaning that about 50% of the people who get Ebola died. Now, this was prior to remdesivir, which is an antiviral, which is showing great promise for Ebola. It's one of the most modern uh, medical antiviral miracle drugs, um, and it's really helping with Ebola. But at the time of what was happening to Kent Brantley, remdesivir was a drug that was only available in experimentally in labs in the U.S. So what happened with Kent Brantley is he volunteered for Samaritan's Purse as part of their forward reaching medical teams and went to the front lines of those treating Ebola. Many Ebola uh, doctors refused to treat Ebola just because it's so easy to catch and so dangerous. So Kent Brantley goes, he's there and he ends up catching Ebola. And it's, it's fascinating to hear his 
story on what he does is he starts again, being a physician, he totally understands what's happening to his body. He understands the progression of the disease. And then the first hours of Ebola, he's like, I hope I'm not getting Ebola. He wasn't totally sure. He's just like, maybe I'm a little bit sick. And so he's challenges with this. And then his nurse gets Ebola about, it ends up being about a day and a half later. I think it's about, about 38, 39 hours later, she comes down with symptoms. Well, what happens is the Samaritan's purse is able to, they hear about this drug remdesivir, they send him back to uh, be treated in Atlanta, which is a, in the state of Georgia in the United States. But it looked like they only had enough remdesivir really to treat one person fully. And they had about enough of the drug made at the time to give about a half dose of treatment to someone else. Well, Kent knew that he was further along in progression. And he said, give this nurse the full treatment, whatever's left over, I'll take. Well, by God's grace, they both made it out alive. And so he became person of the year in, in the United States for a couple of reasons. One, for volunteering. He was not paid to go serve um, to, to fight Ebola. People were touched by his story that he gave the dose away to a nurse. But really something more touched people's hearts. And I want to, I'm going to have you watch an interview with him. I want you to see how he has an eternal view of God. So let's, let's listen to what he says here. What is the most common question? The interviewer is going to ask him a question. What is the most common question you get after your experience with Ebola? He says, a lot of people ask me about my faith bringing me through Ebola. So a lot of people go, oh, you got sick. How did your faith bring you through Ebola? Like, how did it help get you better? How big a role did your faith play? Do you think your faith saved you? Now, I want you to listen to his answer. Does he think his Christianity saved him and saved his life from Ebola? But yes or no? No. He says, I really think in a real way, it's my Christianity, my faith that gave me Ebola. My attempt living out a faith of Christianity put me in a place where I contracted the Ebola virus. My hope was not that my faith would cure me. It's more like the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whose faith didn't hinge on whether God delivered them from death. And even if he doesn't heal me, I want to be faithful. Yet today, what is propped up all over Christianity is a essentially a gospel that God wants you to be purely healthy, purely wealthy, and full of vitality. But a biblical faith says, I want to remain faithful whether or not God saves me. His faith drove him to where he probably would get Ebola. This is what it means to teach, preach, and live a biblical worldview. We're going to watch an interview of an atheist who hates Christianity. Question him on this. Watch how he answers the question. What role do you think your faith played in all this? That's a hard question for me to answer because I... I try not to compartmentalize my life into this is my faith life, this is my work life, this is my family life. My, my faith is an integral part of, of who I am. It's part of the lens through which I view everything in life. So I can't separate this experience from my faith. Well, some people are going to say, like, the difference might not be his faith. It's that he's an American. He got 
literally the best care on the planet for this versus all the people who don't get that, um, not just in Liberia, but anywhere else. I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that statement. I, I don't think there's anything special about my faith that saved my life. If anything, my faith is what put me in a position where I got Ebola. I don't think there's anything special about my faith that saved my life. If anything, my faith is what put me in a position where I got Ebola. His faith put him in a position where he got Ebola. This is the opposite of the worldview that is being peddled out there. Let me tell you this. I, I want to be really clear. Look around at the popular people who are preaching the gospel. And then look at the apostles. How many of the apostles lived in such a way that people looked at their life and went, wow, I want to be just like them. I want to have the nicest chariots. I want to have the nicest horses. No. All of them ended up giving everything because they knew the resurrection was true. They knew that they had an eternal life and eternal destiny. They didn't bring people into the early church the New Testament church promising them anything other than forgivenesses of their sins to a holy God. Yet what are we doing? So I'm going to close out, leave a little bit of time for Q and a, um, I could go further, but, I don't want to get into the next topic. I think this is uh, far enough. And I'll close with an encouragement. Elizabeth Elliot's first husband was killed when her husband gave up a wonderful career in the United States and went down to South America. They, uh, her husband was killed um, by a tribal region that misunderstood what they were trying to do. But what was remarkable about it is these men actually were armed with weapons. They had guns, but they chose to not fight. And they end up dying. Elizabeth Elliot's husband, Jim Elliot, was a martyr. Much has been written about him uh, in his biblical worldview, I highly encourage uh, reading about his thoughts and reading the Bible. But listen to what sh she says about life. She says, our vision, or the way we look at life, our worldview is so limited, we can hardly imagine a love that does not show itself in protection from suffering. So we believe God's love should keep us from all suffering. Because we have a short view, a limited view, a non-biblical view. The love of God did not protect his own son. Think about that. He will not necessarily protect us, not from anything it takes to make us look like Jesus. God will not protect us from anything that will make us look more like his son. A lot of hammering and chiseling and purifying by fire will have to go into that process. Thank you so much for two days. Really appreciate it. These are heavy things. Not often do I um, jump into these kind of topics, but I was asked to share on what it means to be a loving evangelist, what it means to be a truth forward, a truth leaning. And so thank you for these last two days. I wanted to save enough time, 10 minutes, if there were a few questions, if there were not, that's also great. Uh, no one is ever disappointed for having a few extra minutes. Um, 
of time to process these things. So with that, I'm going to turn this uh, back over to uh, Wheeler and let them take over from there. Thank you again so much. Hi, like if you have questions, then you can ask now.